In this video, we're going to take a look at the pigeonhole principle. So let's say we have a flock of pigeons that fly into a set of pigeonholes to roost. And in this case, let's pretend that there are seven pigeons. So here I have six pigeonholes. So it stands to reason that if the first pigeon goes in the first box and the second pigeon and the third pigeon and so on and so forth, that there are six pigeons in six boxes, but that that seventh pigeon is going to have to buddy up with someone else. That's pretty much what the pigeonhole principle says, that if you have K plus one or more objects placed into K boxes, so in this case we had six boxes, but we had seven or more objects, it stands to reason that at least one box would contain two or more objects. Now that might seem straightforward and very easy and you're thinking, whoopity do, why do we learn this? But obviously there are some applications in mathematics that we are going to take a look at. So first we're going to start by looking at just some easy practice. So for instance, based on that pigeonhole principle, what's the minimum number of people I need to ensure that two people share the same birthday? Well, I know there are 365 days in a year but actually there's 366 days if you count leap year. February 29th happens once every four, every four years. So there's 366 different birthdays. So what's the minimum number of people? So if this is K, I need K plus one. So I need 367 people or more. So the minimum number of people would be 367 people. What is the minimum number of words I need using the English language to ensure that two words start with the same letter? So again, what's K? How many boxes are there? Well, the boxes in this case are the letters. There are 26 letters of the alphabet in the English language. And K plus one would be that I need 27 or more. Looking now at the generalized pigeonhole principle, it's really just going to reiterate what we just talked about, but it's going to give us a more mathy way to solve. So here we say if we have n objects placed into k boxes, then there's at least one box containing the ceiling function of n divided by k objects. So before we get too far into this, let's just go back to our original example where I had seven pigeons and I place them into six boxes. So what the generalized pigeonhole principle says, if we have seven objects placed in six boxes, there's at least one box that contains the ceiling function of seven divided by six, which is 1.16. Ceiling function says what? What is a ceiling function? So just in case we don't understand what a ceiling function is, the ceiling function says take whatever value you have and round it to the next integer. Now two already is an integer, and so two, the ceiling function, would be two. However, what if I had 2.0001? Almost two, but the ceiling function says, okay, that's more than two, so now you have to round up to the next integer. Same thing if I had 2.99, that is less than three, so when I round it up to the next integer, it's going to be three. So back to our example, what does our pigeonhole principle tell us? It says there's going to be at least one box with two objects. Well, that's what we had said before. We said, hey, if we have seven pigeons, we have six pigeonholes, then there's at least one pigeonhole that has two pigeons in it. And that's exactly what this is saying. Let's take a look at a very straightforward example straightforward application. If we have 50 people, what's the number of people that must be born on the same month? So again, 50 people would be 50 objects, that's n, and the number of people that must be born on the same month, that's the number of boxes, so k is 12. So really we're just saying let's take 50 divided by 12, which gives us 4.16 repeating, and that was also repeating up there. And using the ceiling function, we round that to five. So if we have 50 people, 
then the number of people that must be born on the same month is five. Now it could be more than that, but we're saying worst case scenario, five. Now the next question, a little bit trickier, still the same pigeonhole principle, but a little bit uh, more complicated. So here we have the number of students in a class must there be to ensure that three students get the same grade of A, B, C, D, or F. So hopefully we can see that this would be the boxes. We're trying to put people into the boxes of which grade they get. This is going to be the outcome. So if I were to set this up, it would look more like, oops, that's a bad ceiling, N, divided by five is equal to three. Now, it's not as straightforward to solve this because if I were solving this, this would say five times three is 15, but that's not what I want, right? Because this is a ceiling function. So before we talk about the mathematical way to solve this, let's just work it out uh, just by reasoning. If I have, I'm gonna erase this, if I were to have, again, we're looking for ensure that there are three that get the same grade. Let's look at worst case scenario is everybody or every box has two students. So I have two students with an A, two with a B, two with a C, two with a D, two with an F. That's 10 students. Can I ensure then that there are three students that get the same grade with 10? No, but by the pigeonhole principle, if I add one more to that, which is 11, now I can ensure that three students get the same grade because that last pigeon or that last student needs to go in one of the boxes that already has two people in it. So 11 is the correct answer. So now the question becomes, how do I solve that mathematically? Well, because we're dealing with the ceiling function, what I want to do is say that I want one less than this, so I'm going to look at what happens if I take n divided by five equals two. Well, obviously if I multiply each side by five, I get n is equal to 10. Now, is that the answer? No, because we already talked about the fact that the answer is 11. So how can I set this up mathematically? I can say n minus one. So really I'm taking one away from here and one away from here. And now if I solve this, I say if I multiply each side by 10 or by 5, I get n minus 1 is equal to 10. I add 1 to each side, I get that I must have 11. So that's one way to do it. Again, because we're dealing with the ceiling function, I can take 1 away from here and 1 away from here. And really the 1 away from the n is so that at the end I can add one more, just like I did here. Let's take a look at another practice, and this is a two-part question. This one, I have a bowl that contains 10 red and 10 yellow balls, and I want to know how many balls must be selected to ensure three balls of the same color. So hopefully we can see that this is almost exactly the same type of question that we just did. So I can look at worst case scenario and say, okay, if the first one was red and then the second one was red, and then the next one was yellow and the next one was yellow, now I'm in a position where the next one is going to have to make it so that I have three red or three yellow. So the correct answer is five. Now, obviously I don't wanna to have to reason through it like that. I want to just be able to do the math. So again, we're saying we have two bins and we're solving for N and we want to be three balls of the same color. So how did we do this before? We said, let's say n minus one divided by two was equal to three minus one. So we took one away from n and one away from the result since we're dealing with the ceiling function. So we get n minus one over two is equal to two. Multiplying each side by two, I get n minus one equals four. Adding one, I get n is five. And again, I showed a lot of work there, um, but you get the idea that that's a really easy way to go about solving a question like that. Now, the next one can't really be solved with the pigeonhole principle um, in a direct application. So it's saying how many balls must be selected to ensure three yellow balls? So again, I'm gonna be thinking about worst case scenario. 
Worst case scenario says, I'm going to pick a red and then a red and then a red and then a red all the way through until I run out of reds. Now, we could talk probability, well, that's not very po probable, but possible. So basically, I could have all 10 reds before I draw a yellow, and then I'm going to get a yellow and a yellow and a yellow. So the correct answer is 13. And there's really no um, mathematical way for you to apply um, n divided by k what we just talked about with the pigeonhole principle. There's really no way to do that except to say you're going to draw all the all the reds first and then you're going to start adding yellow balls. Here are three questions I would like you to try on your own which are just different applications of the pigeonhole principle. When you are ready, press play to see how you did. For the first one, this is structured in the same way that we have done a couple of other questions. We are solving for n. We're saying what's the minimum number of students, n, each of whom comes from one of the 50 states. That would be considered the number of bins that we have, or boxes, enrolled in a university to guarantee at least 100. So if I were to set this up, I would say n divided by 50 equals 100. And then remember, the easiest way to solve this is to say n minus 1 divided by 50 is equal to 100 minus 1, which is 99. To solve, I would multiply each side by 50. So I would get n minus 1 is equal to 4,950. So I would need, adding 1 to each side, n to be 4,951. So the question is, I would need a minimum of 4,951 students to ensure that I have at least 100 from the same state. For B, there are 38 different time periods during which classes at a university can be scheduled. If there are 677 different classes, how many different rooms will be needed? So we have 38 different time periods and 677 classes. This is a straight up application. So I'm going to take 677 divided by 38, which gives me 17.8157 blah, blah, blah. Doesn't matter. I know that that rounds up to 18. So I will need 18 different rooms in order to make that scheduling work. And lastly, a computer network consists of six computers. Each computer is directly connected to one or more of the other computers. Show there are at least two computers directly connected to the same number of computers. So I have six computers. That's N. Each computer is directly connected to one or more. So one or two or three or four or five computers. So that would constitute five boxes. And so again, this is straight up six divided by five gives me a ceiling function of two. So yes, I have just shown that there are at least two computers that are directly connected to the same number of other computers, because if we have one computer connected to one, one computer connected to two, and so on and so forth, that leaves one that must be connected to the same number as a different computer. Coming up next, I want to take a look at just a pigeonhole proof. So I'm not actually going to prove the pigeonhole principle. There are two proofs in your textbook for the pigeonhole principle, so I'm not going to go through that with you. I do want to go through a proof that, however, uses the pigeonhole principle. 